Well, Gerald, um, what makes a great speech? A great speech moves people from one place to another, changes their mind. And on the morning of the 8th of May, I heard a great speech. And it came from the lips of Nick Clegg. And that was a speech, thank you, that was a speech that made it clear to everyone what the value of liberalism was, the value of the Liberal Democrats had been and must be, and how soon we would be missed. And we, don't need to wait, we didn't need to wait that long to find out that was true. And we in our hearts believe this to be true, and we look back and see what we achieved, and you just think, what five years in power, five years we should be proud of, meant for our country. Two billion pounds of funding through the pupil premium to the very schools that Tories don't send their kids to. Eight billion pounds worth of green energy funding. Rested out of a chance to invent all that stuff is not saving the planet, but green crap. And I'll tell you what makes me most proud. Nick Clegg went into number 10 and he expended vast amounts of personal political capital in order to set free the 5,000 children of asylum seekers who would have been detained in this last parliament if it wasn't for him. He knew as he went into those meetings he would not win a single vote. Those 5,000 children of asylum seekers do not know who it is to whom they must be thankful. That is the measure of a man who I am still proud to call my leader. Woo! <laughs> it moved people. Today, something like 18,000 people who woke up that morning horrified and saw the message from Nick Clegg and thought, yes, the penny dropped, yes, I need to be more than just a Liberal in here, I need to be a Liberal Democrat indeed, and that number is still rising. And I am proud, proud, proud of all of those people who've joined us, because we may well think demoralised and broken, so many of us, following the election on the 7th of May. But we are lifted and our spirits are raised and there is adrenaline pumping through our veins because we know that we are not alone, that there are tens of thousands of people out there who support our movement and want us to thrive and survive. But on the 7th of May, this party was ejected into the political wilderness. And the only thing that matters in this leadership election is how do we get out of it? How do we get out of it? And let's be honest, we also need a full understanding of what kind of wilderness we are in. You see, the loss of all our members of Parliament on the 7th of May is only half a bit, if even that. For the last 10 years, we have been losing ground in local government. And so look, I don't want to give it all away tonight. I don't want to kind of uh, tell you exactly what's going to happen in the next hour or so, but let me share with you this. Two real liberals will stand up here. They will agree with each other on 99% of matters. Even the grumpy, sorry, will agree with them 95%. <laughs> 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 no way and we will agree with us, and we will agree on our policies and our principles and ideals, and here's the tragedy. We can do nothing about them when we're out of power. So you may have lots of questions for me, and for Norman, I hope so, but I will be impertinent, I've got one question for you. Do you want to win? Do you want to win? Because if you do, I am your man. Because I am stood here because I am not having the party of Gladstone, Lloyd George and Grimmins die on my watch. And I am not having the party that rescued and ran so well the cities of Manchester, Sheffield, Hull and Newcastle for so many years, so well in the past. I'm not having them disappear off the horizon, over the horizon. I want our position in local government to grow and to thrive. Winning is all that matters because if you lose, you are robbed of the ability to change people's lives. What drove me when I got elected to Lancashire County Council, just shy of my 23rd birthday, and to South Liverpool District Council a couple of years later, and to South Leyland District Council what, 11 years ago. Now, uh, I guess it's my background, where I come from. You know, in politics it's very important that people know who you are. I suspect often we lose votes because people don't know who we are. So who am I? Well, I was brought a little bit further north of here, not much, in the town, sorry, city now, of Preston. And I've brought up, you know, let's be honest, in some poverty. Me and my little sister, raised by a single mum. And uh, we had very little. And as I looked around me, you know, my mates, all the people 
at school, half of our parents were out of work from one time or another, sometimes most of the time, and we had very little. And I think the measure of a great parent is you never knew you were poor until many, many years later. But my childhood was incredibly happy, by the way. And I never knew we were poor, and what really struck me, I suppose, um, and what really dawned upon me, was when my grandmother passed away in my late 20s, and I was washing up the day of her funeral with my mum. And uh, we talked about the fact that my grandmother's wedding ring had been melted into my great grandmother's wedding ring. I just said to my mum, whatever happened to your wedding ring? Whatever happened to it? She just said, I pawned it to feed you when you were seven. I mean, crumbles. And I then think, now how could I end up in a situation where I ended up going to university and getting a half decent job and then ended up here? How did that happen? Well, I think it happened because I was fortunate or blessed enough to have a bloody minded parent who never knew when she was being. No wonder I became a little Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have to be that blessed and that lucky to make it in life. That's the point. When I look around the people I grew up with and who I still know, my friends, those people from that part of Lancashire, I kind of look around them and I don't feel pity. I just think, what a waste. What a waste of wonderful people and wonderful talent. Because inequality in this country is the scourge of this country. You have got much more chance of being uh, poorly paid if you're a woman than if you're a man. If you are a white person, you will probably be paid more than if you are not a white person. If you are LGBT+, plus, you will have fewer life chances than if you are not. If you are from some regions of the country, this included, you will end up with fewer life chances than if you are from others. And the reality is this. Inequality is not just immoral, it is immoral, but it is also utterly and totally stupid. If you ran a country, or ran a company, and you've only made use of 20% of your staff and 20% of your space, you would be an idiot and you would fail, and that is Britain. <laughs> so you want to be not just of the view that we are against inequality, because inequality is bad, we are for equality because equality is good. And I fear that too often we spend a lot of time telling people what we are against, not what we are for. Because in politics, it's all about who you are. And I want us to say things in these next few months, in these next few years, but don't just tell people what we will do, but tell people who we are. We are the kind of people who are outward looking, generous spirited, internationalist, anti nationalist, therefore we will lead the fight to keep the UK in the European Union. We are. Today, we think about tomorrow, we don't just care about you, we care about your children and their children, therefore we will lead the fight against climate change. We are the kind of people who know that nothing robs you more of your dignity or your liberty than poverty and poor housing. Therefore, we will be the party, probably the only party, who will stand firm against Cameron's sell-off of housing association properties. brought together tell people who we are. We are the kind of people who trust people. We are the kind of people who think the best of people. And we plan for the best of people. So look, as I stand here and I look at where we are today, and we look at the situation our party finds ourselves in, we of course can take some level of heart from the fact that this is not, as many people know, our first near-death experience. <laughs> And the fact that under Grimman and Steele and Paddy Ashdown, thanks to the revival in our local government base under those three great leaders, particularly under Paddy Ashdown in the late 80s and early 90s, the fact that happened should not make us complacent. We never survived in the past by accident. We have no automatic right to pull through. You have seen this last six weeks with the attack on human rights, the attack on personal uh, security in terms of our ability to be on the internet and not snooped on by Big Brother, are those attacks of 12 billion potential cuts in uh, benefits. You have seen these last six weeks how essential it is that this party survives and thrives. It is essential that we survive, but it is not inevitable. We have to earn every single one of the building blocks that will build and create that recovery. And it's not good enough just to want and wish the Liberal Democrats to be better and to come back. You have to plan for it, you have to make it so. So I have a plan. And you are looking at, I'm afraid, the only Liberal Democrat candidate 
in the election <coughs> that just passed who got more than 50% of the vote. In Westland, <laughs> oh, that is an outrage. It's an outrage. You are looking at the only part of mainland Britain where the Liberal Democrats came first in the European elections last May. And even those blooming, dreadful police commission elections that we want to get rid of, three and a half years ago, the only place in the UK the Lib Dems came first? Yep, South Lakeland. And that's not an accident. It's because the way we operate, the way I operate, is to build teams and to inspire them and to motivate them and to direct them and to lead them. We have not a few hundred, we have 2,000 volunteers in Westland. That is why we won. That is why when the tsunami came crashing over, there was a big flipping Everest that we were on the top of and we didn't get wet. And my job is to make sure every councillor, every, every MP, every potential candidate in this country is equally elevated and out of the way of harm. Because we need to serve the people in this country and that means we need to build an infrastructure and a movement that will protect us all from defeat, better still, launch us on the way to victory. So, um, as we consider who might be our next leader, I think it's just worth, if you wouldn't mind, to spend a few seconds reflecting on our fallen leader. Two days ago, several of us, Norman and I included, were at the Butte Hall of Glasgow University as we celebrated the life of Charles Kennedy. I want to reflect on why he was a great man, and he absolutely was a great man. Three things. First, he was human. Everybody could say that, but what it meant was that his word got through to people. If you've ever tried to put people on message, and there's one or two people in here who tried to put Charles Kennedy on message, and they've got very little hair left. <laughs> if you tried to put Charles, Charles Kennedy on message, you would find that he was always on message. It was just it was his message. And it was true, and it came through, and he cut through, and people listened, because if people trust the messenger, they will hear the message. He was human. He was principled. It's easy now, looking back after 12 years, to think that the opposition to the Iraq war was the easy populist decision to take back in 2003. You know that it was not. You know that Charles Kennedy was bathed and heckled out by Tories and Labour alike, called Charlie Chamberlain the traitor, as he stood up proudly in favour of international institutions and against that illegal and immoral Iraq war that he so rightly called, and he rightly called, would be counterproductive. And those newspapers, I'm sad to say, tabloid press often, who lauded him and honoured him in their write-ups and their obituaries two weeks ago, they're the very papers who had him depicted as the slippery traitor Charles Kennedy who wouldn't back our boys in the Gulf. I tell you, they were wrong. And Charles Kennedy today stands proud as being absolutely right, and I am proud of Charles Kennedy. Effective. This is the guy who led us to our largest number of MPs since Lloyd George's day, and I want to suggest this to you. This is my hypothesis. You see, human, principle, effective, the three are sequentially connected. The fact is, the good guys can win. We have just been through an election where the bad guys were smarter, where the bad guys understood the mood of the electorate, where the bad guys outspent and outcampaigned, and the bad guys won. Charles Kennedy is the proof that does not always have to be the case. And I want to lead this party to the position where the good guys can be ruthless, where the good guys win, where the good guys win because the people need them to win. And so I don't want you to select one leader in this contest. We need 62,000 leaders who are going to lift us as a party, as a movement, back from the brink, back to the centre. I am convinced that we have been gathered together for such a time as this. If you elect me your leader, your feet will hurt because you will deliver more leaders and the more than you ever have done before. Your bank balances will hurt because you will donate more than you can afford. Your shoulders will hurt from whacking up state boards that you wouldn't like to do. And your faces will ache from the mile-wide grins you will have because we are going to win again. <laughs>